I'd like to open the conversation by giving the context of the book and the main themes. Uh, since uh, people haven't read the book, obviously in the book we go into great detail and unpack the skeletal outline that I'm going to give you. Uh, so I encourage you to read it. But for the purpose of the discussion, let me just um, open it up with the context in which the book was written. <clears throat> the rise of populism in the West, the rise of China in the East, and the spread of social media everywhere is prompting a rethinking of how democracy works or doesn't work. Globalization and digital capitalism have created new classes of winners and losers that the old social contract is not configured to deal with. Now China comes into the picture because it challenges the dysfunctional democracies of the West to figure out how to get beyond our polarization and paralysis and reach a governing consensus through other than authoritarian means or fall into second class status on the world stage. We have a president, current president, Donald Trump, who relishes battling his way through every 24-hour news cycle by hurling barbed tweets at sundry foes. China's leader, in the meantime, by contrast, is using his enormous power to chart out a roadmap for the next 30 years. So in the book, we propose several responses uh, to these challenges. Uh, the three Ps, participation without populism, predistribution of wealth instead of redistribution, and positive nationalism. So the first point, uh, participation without populism. <clears throat> Since social networks have drawn more players into the political fray than ever before, never has the need, need been greater for the counterbalance of impartial institutions and practices to sort out the cacophony of voices, the welter of conflicting interests, and the deluge of contested information. In order to mend the breach of distrust between the institutions of self-government and the public, we propose a new form of citizen engagement called participation without populism. That means integrating social networks and more direct democracy into the political system through new mediating, new mediating institutions that complement representative government. To give just one example, we can talk more in the, in the question and answer, but to give one example, had such a public platform for the liberation been present before the Brexit referendum, and all the consequences we now know were aired, it would have been a very different outcome. Uh, second, uh, Redistribution. The innovations of digital capitalism are steadily disruptive and increasingly divorcing employment and income from productivity growth and wealth creation. A social contract that responds to this dynamic would protect workers instead of jobs as tasks continually uh, churn through innovation and foster an ownership share by all citizens in the wealth being generated by the robots that are displacing gainful employment. The aim is to increase the skills and assets of the less well-off in the first place, pre-distribution, instead of distributing the wealth of others after the fact. We call this universal basic capital instead of universal basic income. We could discuss that more in the, in the question and answer period. The best way to fight inequality in the digital age is to spread the equity around. Uh, third, positive nationalism. To harness globalization, we call for rolling back or dialing back hyperglobalization through reciprocal trade agreements and adjustment policies to cope with integrated global markets, uh, while embracing positive nationalism, which means, in our, uh, in our uh, sense, an allegiance to the values of inclusive society however tempered by the recognition that open societies require defined borders. To temper the growing rivalry, which especially we're seeing today after the trade escalation uh, yesterday, to temper the growing rivalry between the US and China, uh, we call for a partnership of rivals around climate action, even as disputes deepen in other realms. Unless there is some area of common intent around a convergent interest like climate change or global warming, all else will dwell in the shadow of distrust 
and we're headed to a new Cold War, to the breakup of the world once again into geopolitical blocks and worse. So participation without populism, redistribution and positive nationalism. Unless we follow a course along that path, uh, our fear is that the Western democracies are position positioning themselves on the wrong side of history. So that gives you a, a summary of the whole book. Um, obviously, like I said at the beginning, we unpack all of those details in the book and Reed's gonna drill into that a little bit. Uh, and um, then we'll take your questions and answers. Okay, Great. thanks Reed. Um, so just before we start, um, part of the work uh, that the book comes out of Renovating Democracy is part of what the Bergen Institute is working on more generally. Uh, I'm on the board, so I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that. And uh, Nicholas, the very first question, just describe a little bit about what the Bergen Institute's about, and then we will go from there into the, the democracy pillar, which this book is central to. Well, thank you, Reed. Well, thank you uh, for being here today. Uh, thank you, Commonwealth Club. Uh, thank you, Nathan, my co-author, with whom uh, the Institute was started. But really, especially thank you, Reed, because uh, Reed uh, is obviously an, a successful entrepreneur, but he's a very, very thoughtful person. And uh, we've experienced this uh, working with Reed over the years uh, on very difficult subjects. And the book tries to address some of the, I would say, challenges and opportunities that the world offers us today. Um, the Institute itself was created almost 10 years ago now with a focus on ideas, on <coughs> ideas that will help us rethink or shape the world on subjects that concern all of, all of us. And the Institute has four main themes that we work on. Democracy, Capitalism, geopolitics, and the future of the human. Who are we becoming? Who can we be uh, in the age of artificial intelligence and gene editing? And three of those, at least, are covered to some extent in the book, meaning democracy, rethinking capitalism, and geopolitics. The Institute has two centers on purpose, on the almost opposing sides of the world politically and culturally, Los Angeles and Beijing. So from the beginning, we've tried to think about these issues in a way that hopefully is somewhat creative and provocative. We did write a book, Nathan and I, some, I think, seven years ago on the same subjects. And unfortunately, we were maybe a little bit early in terms of seeing that there are going to be real challenges to you know, coexisting in a world where, uh, let's say, um, power is shifting, um, the capacity to govern is shifting, a world where incomes are going up, but inequality is going up as well, and um, a world where uh, everybody has access, meaning everybody is connected, everybody can have a voice and will want to have a voice, but how do you federate those voices? How do you bring people together as opposed to apart? So these are the issues we try to work on at the Institute, and we are very lucky that and one of the things we do is not only to work with people across cultures, that's why I said West and East, but also across disciplines. So we'll engage with people like Reed, who are knowledgeable in the real world technology, but also um, exposed to pretty much everything um, around politics and capitalism and AI and other things. Um, so we'll engage with people across disciplines, politics, um, philosophy, um, even artists. So diving into the book, let's start very simply with a title, Renovating Democracy. Obviously, there are a bunch of different words could be here, everything from renew to, you know, uh, reform, so forth. Why renovate? What's the, what's the suggestion in the metaphor of renovation? The suggestion is uh, like you're renovating a house, um, as opposed to remodeling a house or uh, in renovating a house, you keep the foundation, 
and you update the wiring and the appliances, but you don't tear the whole place down. Um, because what we, what we try to do in the book is, uh, and I think one of the more interesting parts of the book, is go back to the thinking of the founding, American founding fathers about why they came to the conclusions they did in, in the American Constitution, uh, about the role of citizens, about the role of elites. Uh, the word democracy is never mentioned in the Bill of Rights. It's never mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. It's not mentioned in the Constitution because the Founding Fathers were very distrustful of democracy from their uh, study, uh, which they were very steeped in, of Greek and Roman antiquity. Uh, their concern was to be sure that the passions of the public were not directly expressed, but filtered through cool, and, uh, deliberate, cool, cool reason and deliberation um, before laws were made. Uh, so that's kind of the foundation you want to keep. Uh, in the book, we trace the evolution of that sensibility, which the Founding Fathers came to by their own experience in the states before they wrote the Constitution, to 100 years later in the Progressive Era, in which the states uh, that were, uh, uh, where the progressives were in power came up with the idea of direct democracy, where if the, if the cronies who were running the cities and the states were corrupt, you need to go around them and make law directly through the people. But they also had the idea of smart governance. Uh, before the era, progressive era, you, did, you had cronies running cities, not city managers, not professional city managers. So they combined direct democracy with the idea of smart government. So what we try to do is take that foundation and try to figure out for the digital age, where as I said in my, my opening remarks, there's more players than ever before drawn into the system through social networks and figure out what that means for the principles of democracy now. So the idea is to renovate based on those foundations, uh, not to create something new or to hew, to, we, we reform kind of hues to what's already been. Um, so that's why we use the word renovation. So you have this, you know, it's, it's clever to have these kind of three Ps as a way of, of looking at this. And if you go, if you say participation without populism, we seem to already be deeply in the throes of populism, right, today. Uh, not just here in the US, but also Europe, a bunch of the Western democracies. It is, of course, fashionable to say, well, what's new must be the internet, you know, must be social networks. But of course, if you look back, there was already, you know, things happening with Sinclair TV, cable news, you know, talk radio, a whole bunch of things. It may just be kind of a progress. Do you think this effort to try to get to, to, to revise, to trying to get to participation without populism is simply a change of like how we do social networks or is it something deeper? And in which case, how would you, how would you go into that well, deeper angle? Uh, <clears throat> some people here may be familiar with the book by the historian Neil Ferguson called uh, the, the Tower and the Square, where he argues what's new about networks. They've always been networks. You know, there was the Catholic Church as a network. The Reformation was a network. That's all true. But the scope, of, the scope <laughs> and scale of connectivity, the scope, scale, and density of connectivity uh, and the real time of connectivity is a completely different animal uh, than, tho than those days. Uh, the religious wars after the Reformation where the networks were fighting with each other took 100 years. Uh, you know, we have a president that rose to power over a year on Twitter. So uh, I think that's a game changer for governance because it, unlike anything since the printing press, the Gutenberg press, it levels the playing field between amateurs and professionals, uh, between elites and, uh, and ordinary amateurs and ordinary people, and, and indeed government <laughs> and citizens. So uh, the, 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 the challenge is how to uh, embrace that connectivity instead of resist it, because it's not going away, uh, and figure out how to employ the principles of the Founding Fathers uh, of cool and reasoned deliberation um, so that what democracy is about is, is not just about elections. Uh, you can get elected, uh, as Donald Trump showed on, on Twitter, but the, the operational mechanisms of democracy, compromise, negotiation, uh, reaching a governing consensus, doesn't happen uh, over connectivity. In fact, um, uh, Wael Ghanim, uh, the Egyptian uh, Google executive in Egypt, whose Facebook page really helped launch 
the, the Egyptian spring, says uh, he once thought the internet would liberate society. Uh, and now with all the things we know, echo chambers, hate speech, everything else, it actually undermines the ability to make change. And so he's focused these days on not speaking truth to power through networks, but speaking truth to social media. So the question becomes, how do you create institutions that do that? So what, if what we propose in the book, there are many ways to do it, but the fundamental thing is how do you get a deliberative filter uh, in there between the pure expression of network public sentiment and governance? So just to give an example, I mentioned the Brexit. You know, Brexit, Brexit was a, a, a pure vote, uh, undeliberated. Uh, do we want in or do we want out? The consequences weren't discussed. The consequences weren't aired. Uh, the second reading, so to speak, of the, le of the referendum did not take place. People voted on it and found out the consequences afterwards. That's not the way to deal with direct democracy, especially in a, wor in a networked and connected world. So for example, <coughs> a, a, a way that could have been done, uh, and on a highly contentious and emotional issue, is the example of what happened in Ireland. Um, Ireland go uh, government set up a series of citizens' assemblies where basically uh, what you do is you get together in a depoliticized space, meaning outside the electoral arena, pro and con forces with experts you know, and, and, uh, and verified facts, like a jury, like a, when you go to a jury, you get the, you know, the, the uh, defense and the, and, the, uh, and the prosecutor and you present it with the facts and, and you evaluate them. Uh, so uh, uh, Ireland did this on several issues, cli uh, climate change, um, some urbanization issues, but also on abortion. There was a clause in the, in the Irish Constitution that outlawed abortion, Article 8 in the Irish Constitution. The question was, should it be removed? And you can imagine what kind of debate that would be in Ireland, in Catholic Ireland. Through these series of citizen assemblies, outside the electoral arena where, people, where parties are vying for power, people sat down and discussed the pros and cons and said, well, you know, we're for abortion, we're against abortion, but in any case, it shouldn't be in the Constitution. We're not saying abortion is a good thing, we're not saying it's a bad thing, but we're saying it shouldn't be in the Constitution. And so when the referendum came, 90% of people voted to remove it from the, the Constitution. This was an example of a citizen's assembly. So that's, there are many other uh, examples. Uh, Taiwan uses uh, uh, online platforms uh, to discuss various ideas like whether Uber um, should be allowed uh, in Taipei vis-a-vis -vis taxis and so on. Uh, it was discussed online uh, by groups that are indicative of the whole public scientifically, sam scientifically sampled groups that then recommend the legislation and the legislators then legislate on that basis. Um, so those are the kind of things, it, it, to use the example of California, we can come back if you want to California, we're all, we're all here in California. Yep. Thank uh, we have a governor, we have a legislature, but California is basically a direct democracy. All the consequential decisions, taxes, budget, environment, are made by citizens at the ballot box. Now, Nicholas and I helped change the law with a group of other uh, uh, civic groups uh, in 2014 um, to introduce more deliberation and transparency in, in negotiation into the process. Before 2014, uh, if uh, 385,000 people have get, you know, signed a petition uh, it qualified for the ballot, you could outlaw same-sex marriage, which happened. You could uh, outlaw benefits for immigrants, which happened. They were thrown out by the courts later. Or you can say, let's tax the rich or don't tax property. That's what happened. There's no second reading of the thing when it goes to the ballot. So we created a situation uh, in 2014, a law, where once 25% of the signatures are gathered, the legislature can then negotiate with the sponsors to come to a... Uh, agreement that can be done by legislation. Um, and if they come to an agreement, sponsors can withdraw the initiative and it's passed by legislation, um, or they can proceed to the ballot. Uh, so the point is there's a second reading in which all the unintended consequences, um, the mistakes, I mean, literally before 2014, you couldn't change a comma or a semicolon once an initiative was qualified. Uh, obviously, that's not a way to run uh, a serious uh, government. Um, now that's probably not far enough. Now through that process already, uh, the Digital Privacy Act, the first in the, in the country, was passed. It was an, originally initiative um, by a, a, a guy here in San Francisco. Uh, 
the um, big tech companies got, you know, rattled by it and, and came to the table. There was negotiation uh, and was passed by legislation. Same thing with the minimum wage law. Minimum wage law was um, proposed, there was several things on the ballot by three or four different unions. Uh, the governor was concerned because there's a scheduling up to uh, $15 an hour over a period of years. The governor was concerned that in a recession, the budget would, would uh, uh, take a big hit uh, and the state would still be on the, on the hook to pay the minimum wages for in-home care, which is billions and billions of dollars. He negotiated with the sponsors, give me a pause if there's a recession and we'll go forward. So there was a second reading, the consequences were understood and then it was passed. So now we've created, I'll stop in a second, I don't wanna go too deep, but we're Californian, so I- <laughs> I, 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 I was gonna ask you about the Think Long anyway. Oh, so. uh, important to discuss. So yeah. what happened though with, with our initiative change from 2014, by being able to withdraw initiatives, uh, the other problem with direct democracy is it's captured by special interests, often. It's not just citizens doing it, it's like oil companies, out-of-state oil companies, or soda companies in this case. Soda companies proposed uh, and got people to, to, got enough signatures to qualify, a measure which would require every locality to have a two-thirds vote on fees, or ta uh, fees, any new fees or taxes. So. The point, what, what they were really after was not that. What they're really after is to stop any taxes on sugary drinks and localities, because they didn't want that to spread around the country. So they proposed this measure, which they knew would get a popular vote, because who wants to pay taxes? And they blackmailed the, gov the, the legislation of the governor into signing, in, into negotiating a compromise and signing it, giving the soda companies a 12-year moratorium on, ta on soda taxes in order not to face the, con the fiscal consequences of their measure. So now we're going back to the drawing board on that one to enable the legislature to put an alternative on the ballot, so 1A and 1B, uh, in order not to be blackmailed. And then further beyond that, you know, we're proposing a citizens commission, like the ones I described in, in Ireland, that would be a way to vet uh, initiatives. So getting a, 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 a deliberative filter in there between network public, public sentiment and actual governance and making laws is really what the challenge is. And in that deliberative filter, because, uh, and this will be the, the kind of pointed question for the first P, how is it that that deliberative filter doesn't also get co-opted, right? Because the general problems, of course, in the democracy thing is you can say, oh, we're gonna propose something. It's like the, the I think you covered this in the book, the, you know, the, the, the um, a dirty energy right. tax, so it's for jobs, but actually, in fact, we're trying to release the climate stuff, and when it's a citizen thing, it's out-of-state oil companies, right, <laughs> right is what he's doing this, and so it becomes very co-optable. What makes the deliberative process, by having more time, less co-optable? Well, it's not just more time. Yeah. What corrupts the process is elections, mm -hmm. because elections are not people expressing their uh, preferences Elections are those with the time and money to organize or manipulate the public are the ones who dominate the process. We quote in the book uh, 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 a scholar named Sit Sitterman who wrote a book called The Middle Class Constitution who says elections actually create aristocracies because uh, most of us aren't in organized uh, special interest groups, we're just citizens. You know, so we're outmaneuvered by those. So elections in the first place are where the buy-off comes. Uh, contributions uh, both to the election campaigns uh, and then also uh, a lobby hold on people once they're elected. So by removing, by removing the process, the deliberative process, to the citizen councils, which are in a, in a depoliticized environment uh, of citizens that are selected randomly uh, as opposed to representing uh, constituencies, um, is one way to prevent the co-optation from, from taking place. So it's really the importance of, of going back to a point I made earlier, Democracy is not just elections. Democracy is all the institutions that surround uh, elections um, and that, come, that take into account all the interests of the public. Uh, and so th this is that aspect of democracy which is decayed uh, and, that, and that's what needs to be fixed. And this is, these are one, one way to, to fix them. So let's move to the second P, uh, pre-distribution. Um, a, a way too simplistic reading of this looks like a version of state ownership, right? That's obviously not what you're proposing. 
why don't you kind of describe like why uh, pre-distribution and its correlating idea, universal basic capital, is actually in fact more interesting than just like progressive taxation or, or other kinds of things and why it navigates the historical problems with kind of a, a more socialist central, centralized approach. And Nicholas, I'll call on you to start on this question. Okay, so um, what has happened in, in the world? Well, capitalism has really conquered the world. Uh, even communist China, in essence, is capitalist. So capitalism has empowered uh, participation on this part of almost anyone in the economy. The question, and it's created progress and wealth. The question is, is it fair? And is it at a point where inequalities are beginning to challenge the health of the system? And it seems that we are there pretty much in every capitalist environment. And the question is, how do you, you know, rebalance it? And the simple uh, instinct or reaction is just to say, well, listen, let's transfer from the ones who have to the ones who have less. And that, that has been uh, the way. Um, but what does it do? One, it creates confrontation. Uh, two, it's not necessarily that efficient. Um, and lastly, the world has changed and is continuing, continuing to change, where, frankly, <coughs> labor, meaning people, and capital are becoming less and less important. So the concentration of wealth is going to be more and more in the IP, in the intellectual property. So you, you don't need a lot of people, you don't need a lot of capital, to create enormous value. So how do you sort of share, in essence, in a world that's going to be more and more divided, where labor in a traditional way and capital in a traditional way is going to be rewarded much less? How do you uh, distribute not only money, but opportunities and dignity? You have to do it beyond just an economic fight. And the question is, how do you do this? How do you bring people together as opposed to um, have people uh, be apart. And this idea of pre-distribution is to sort of reverse things, as opposed to everybody fighting it out and then having to rebalance. Why not give everyone a chance from the beginning? So why don't give everybody a piece of the economic pie um, at the start? Uh, that doesn't mean that you couldn't do some redistribution later, uh, but you at least bring everybody together and have everybody share in the economic future of whatever the success is. So concretely, uh, if Reed starts a new company, um, in lieu of taxes, or maybe in exchange of lower taxes, uh, Reed's new company, uh, Reed Co., um, will um, uh, contribute a percentage, 10%, 20%, a percentage of its capital to the state. And that'll go into a big sovereign wealth fund. Uh, you actually mean equity. You yes. Mean, you don't mean capital, you mean equity, just equity. Yes, yes, yes. equity. Yeah, yeah. So Reed, as opposed to starting with 100% of his business, starts with 80% of his business. Still plenty, so if it's a success, Reed will be very happy. But the 20% that goes to the state is really for all the citizens in the state. And so that if Reed Co. is a great success, we going to be very happy. Uh, the people who work there are probably going to benefit. Other shareholders will. But then the entire state will. And that means all the citizens. And thanks to technology, let's say blockchain, you can attribute um, uh, a share of uh, Reed Co.'s success to every citizen. And because it is then contributed to a big fund, sovereign wealth fund, for example, the cash flow and the economic value of that stake in Reed Co. and many other Reed Co.'s uh, will um, accrue to the benefit of all citizens. That helps then fund the budget. The budget then, and this is very important, can um, you know, deliver services, 
that are the basic services that empower people. But everybody starts owning something and everybody's in the same boat. So that if Reedco is a success, it's everybody's success. And uh, they're not, they're, he's, Reed is a bigger winner, but he took the risk, he worked and et cetera, et cetera. But everybody else is a winner too, including the state. So as opposed to sta the state generally is always like begging for money or is almost like a debtor. Here the stake actually is an owner f on behalf uh, as a, as a um, uh, on behalf of the citizens. But everybody is an owner as opposed to, you know, people on one side owners, on the other side, you know, if you want consumers or exploited or whatever, everybody's on the same side of the boat. So it's a different, it's a change in mindset. So there's a question from the audience that has a Venn diagram overlap with the question I was going to ask you on predisposition, so I'll ask both of them at the same time. One is, you know, you're a, a very successful investor and business person. Have you done any of the kind of business analysis about, like, what would the needs of the trade-offs of equity and later tax income, like, what any analysis there in terms of thinking about it? And then the question from the audience is, well, roughly, rough guess, how long would it take for, for the predisposition to start kicking into current people and current social inequalities? Like if you were to press go on this January 1st next year, what's the, what's the time frame in that? So in terms of the numbers, we are early days. So uh, anybody's uh, input, advice, ideas, um, you know, very encouraged. This is work in progress and this is a work of imagination. So we're at the beginning of it. But if you... At the end of the day, the, the numbers are the numbers. Um, in Europe, uh, on average, the state is almost half of GDP. In the US, it's about a third. Um, so you know a little bit what percentage of the pie you'd probably have to sort of flip in that direction. So we are talking, you know, a minority stake, uh, but Maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 30% uh, of businesses going forward. You could never go backwards. You could only do this uh, going forward. Um, so I would say that's sort of the range, but early days. Uh, in terms of how long would it take? That's a very interesting question. I think to Nathan's point, in the old world, I think it would have taken a long, long time. Uh, but think, especially since we're sitting here in San Francisco, Think about what's been created in Silicon Valley uh, in terms of truly uh, disruptive but also incredibly valuable businesses over the last 20 years. And uh, I mean, you've got LinkedIn, you've got Facebook, you've got um, Uber, uh, you've got um, uh, Google, Airbnb, I mean, endless amounts of companies. So the, sh the shift is pretty fast. Uh, same in China, by the way, in a totally different environment. But if you look at Alibaba, Tencent, and other incredibly valuable uh, contributors today uh, to the economy, they've been created in the last 10 years, 15 years. So it's fast. So I think once you get things going, that's the beauty of this. You could probably um, change um, uh, the scales pretty quickly. Can I, let me just add, just to, to your earlier point, um, it's not, social, it's not state socialism or centralization. Uh, it's expanded ownership of capital by the public. The, the state is, is, a, is a conduit or a custodian of, of the sovereign wealth funds, but they don't own it. So that's a big, that's a big distinction. Give a little bit more like the Temasek and other examples. You yeah, have well, tem like Temasek and uh, Singapore is a good example of what Nicholas is talking about. They have a huge sovereign wealth fund, a national savings, mandated national savings account in which everyone, employers and uh, citizens, all have to contribute up to a vested point. Um, and they can draw from that after a vested period, not for health care, for education, uh, housing, other things. So uh, the state's not giving them anything. The state's only investing or, or through professionals investing their assets and then paying them a dividend. Um, Nicholas' point about technology, you have uh, already uh, emerging platform cooperatives. Uh, you mentioned Uber or Uber or Lyft and those. What, what is Uber? Uber is basically a company that owns an algorithm uh, that pays people for using their cars to pick other people up. 
There's no reason that couldn't be owned by a neighborhood or a city in which everyone gets a share uh, of that uh, instead of uh, a private venture capital company or, or Uber getting a share of it. Uh, that's a way of sharing uh, a, a predistribution of, of, of sharing ownership uh, in an enterprise. Um, same way in Massachusetts, there's an example of uh, people who share their medical data uh, in exchange for a dividend or royalty fee from the pharmaceutical companies that you know, do inventions out using their data. Um, something I, I know that something that's more slippery, and I know that, that, that uh, our friend Reed doesn't, doesn't like, uh, is what go the governor's proposed, Governor Newsom's proposed, a data dividend, yeah. um, which is the big tech companies use uh, our personal data to make a lot of uh, money. Uh, some of that should flow in some form or another back to, to those whose information are being used. Now, there's complications with that. Uh, data is not oil. Yep. Uh, uh, how do you price data? How do you commodify data? Uh, so there are issues involved. But the Where is the data? Yeah, but the In capital flight, now you have data flight. Right, right. right. So the, the concept is, <laughs> the concept is, uh, the concept is, however, that, uh, that um, if our personal data is what's making Google and Facebook so profitable, uh, shouldn't we share in some of that? So how do you do that? We see technical issues and, and uh, political issues to some extent, um, but the concept is there. But the idea is very much, you know, taxing the robots is very inefficient and it's a fight. What about just owning the robots and the idea is that everybody owns a piece uh, of, of what's gonna become the most valuable, which frankly, robots are becoming more and more valuable. So, um, uh, we'll do an audience question this, uh, for the second part of the second P before we get to the third P. Um, you know, how does the uh, equity translate in income and how does that different, differ from UBI? Right? Because obviously it's the ownership to align uh, incentives for building long, for investing in it. That's part of the, the basis of the idea. Also not to try to wait till things get too out of whack but do some things early as you guys have articulated. But like, what's the, what's, how does that tangibly get to, you know, most people when they're confronting what they need, it's like, well, can I afford my rent? Can I afford my groceries? What's the thought about how, uh, you know, the kind of pre-distribution, universal basic capital translates into income? One, I think, is much more flexible. Two, it's much more powerful because it's, it's very long-term and it builds, you know, <laughs> wealth. Um, economic productivity has a, a way of compounding. So you're, you're part of compounding and you have much more flexibility. Um, universal basic income is really a subsidy and uh, it has limited impact. And it also psychologically, you know, you're getting a handout as opposed to really being part of something. If you own a piece of the capital of um, uh, a country's productivity, uh, you, you know, you're an owner, you're part of the future, then the question is how do you draw on it? And that's where you can look at different ways of, uh, of, of doing it. I talked to Joe Stieglitz about the idea that at different um, points in your life, you might be able to draw uh, more or less, uh, meaning uh, for education or for healthcare or for retirement. Uh, so there's a certain amount of capital that is yours that's part of the sovereign wealth fund. Going back to Singapore, the biggest contributor to the budget, and the budget funds all the social services, which are extremely high. They may be the highest in the world in terms of, you know, it includes housing, but also obviously education, healthcare, security. Um, well, the biggest contributor to the budget are the sovereign wealth funds, which are the savings uh, from the productive assets of the nation, what the nation uh, produces. Uh, therefore, taxes are actually low, incomes are incredibly high, uh, inequality is relatively you know, good considering, and the services are very high. So it's a virtual circle. The whole idea is that it feeds on it on, on, uh, in a positive way as opposed to a negative way. My fear was universal basic um, income is that it's not a builder. Universal basic capital is a builder. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't have times when you use universal basic income. It could be a tool, 
but it shouldn't be the foundation. Going back to Nason's point, you know, you have a house, what's the foundation? The foundation in terms of democracy are certain principles. Foundation in terms of capitalism are also certain principles. Uh, you need to be an owner. So let's make everybody an owner as opposed to some owners and some on the other side. I would just add really quickly, the, if, for those who read the Piketty's book on capital, his main argument is, what's, what's the driver of inequality? It's those who have a return on capital and those who have only their labor. And universal basic income perpetuates the structural, this structure of inequality. Basic, universal basic capital breaks down the structure of inequality. I mean, that's the essential difference. So moving to the third P, and then we'll get to theming some of the excellent audience questions we have. Uh, a few of them we've managed to get in, but there's, there's some notes on social networks and other things we'll get to. Let's talk a little bit about um, positive nationalism. Uh, some people, of course, when you think, go to, go to nationalism and they go, oh gosh, this is a wars, this is, you know, build a wall, this is, you know, uh, our tribe, our race is better than these other tribes' races and are super nervous about it. Some people say, well, nationalism is part of where you have the coherent identity and pride and, and who you are. What do you mean by positive nationalism? And how do you distinguish that from the other places that, you know, where nationalism could lead you astray? Well, as I said in my opening comments, um, uh, and this word, this word comes out, this phrase comes out of a, con a conversation for the book with Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. um, who, who calls for positive nationalism. Is positive nationalism is not opposed to globalization, it's the precondition of global cooperation. Uh, when we say positive nationalism, like, as I said in the beginning, meaning an allegiance to the inclusive values of society, not based on race or ethnicity, but onto the inclusive values of society. Um, but I did add in my open remarks, and this is important and maybe, maybe controversial to some people, uh, open societies need defined borders. Um, <clears throat> societies and cultures are open, but nation states and communities are bounded by territorial jurisdictions with a certain fiscal reality. Um, and so, uh, to have a social contract in which people share the burdens and benefits uh, requires a system that, which don't say closed, but requires a system that's in balance. So uh, uh, just uh, on the one side, those who want to close off all borders, xenophobia and whatever, that doesn't work. Those who want to open every border to everybody, that also doesn't work. Now people are often, uh, what I like to raise in this is people's misconceptions about Canada, for example. Um, uh, Canada has seen, a, and it is, a very tolerant society uh, that well integrates its immigrants. Uh, it took 25,000 refugees from Syria during the Civil War. But Canada has a very strict immigration policy in which 60% of those who uh, are granted immigrant status uh, come on, on what they call the economic class, which is what skills do you have to contribute to what Canada needs. Uh, only the, the rest come from family uh, some kind of a family connection. The U.S. is completely the opposite. Uh, most people come in from a family connection with very little evaluation of skills uh, and what people bring to society, uh, no less what they, what they take from society. So there needs to be a balance there because uh, uh, <coughs> bad faith results from good intentions if you don't have the resources to, to uh, fulfill your moral claims. And I think that's a, that's a reality that people have to come, come to grips with on the, on the immigration issue. And I, I would say, emotionally, being for yourself doesn't mean that you have to be against everybody else. Mm. Yes. <laughs> it's a good lesson that some people should learn. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so um, before we get to, I'm going to try to cluster them. We have a, a bunch of excellent questions. Um, one of the questions that came in early that I was going to also ask about was, um, you know, populism. Uh, how do you define it? Is it a pejorative um, or is it something that actually, in fact, can be harnessed in good ways? Like what essentially where is good populism, where is bad populism? And what is it? Well, there's... Um, uh Some people mean populism. Uh, in my young radical days, uh, 
we used to talk Those about aren't far behind you. Uh, we, we, we used to talk about populism as what the people want. Hmm. And in a sense, that's what pop basically defined what populism is. Um, the, the, the problem in the current environment in particular, and, and uh, I mentioned before the progressive era, the progressive era grew out of a populist revolt in the late, uh, in the late um, 19th century of farmers who were being displaced by, uh, by um, mechanization and, um, and middlemen and uh, uh, the commerce between states and so on. <clears throat> but populism, uh, as, as we say in the book, it hurls uh, pent-up emotions at complex problems uh, and uh, does not uh, engage in, the, and, and by its temperament, does not engage in the, the, enlightened, the enlightenment practices of negotiation, reason, and compromise uh, in order to come to a governing consensus. Um, whether, uh, uh, and, uh, in, in, the, in the current populist environment, if you're not with them, you're against them. Um, and to, uh, to admit uh, anything on, from the other side is to betray your tribe. Um, and that's definitely negative, positive, uh, neg uh, negative populism and it's definitely corrosive. Um, what distinguishes uh, uh, what the people want uh, from populism is what the people get. And what the people will get, uh, if you want to satisfy the roots of the, the, the driving uh, forces of populism, you need these mediating institutions to come to, to consensus and therefore uh, uh, be able to respond to the fundamental issues like more jobs, security, inclusion, etc. Right, it's the deliberative institutions as a way of saying, slow down, calm down a little bit, try to figure out what you really want and how do we get there together. That's essentially the idea. So there's a couple questions. I'm going to start um, going to the thick uh, sheath that I have here from the audience that all go around social networks. And, um, you know, you touch some in the book on the kind of some were the places where the accelerated, you know, pace of the network world, the fact that there is all these different flows of institution of, of information, that a bunch of the information is, um, you know, can be manipulated in various ways, uh, hostile foreign actors, hostile domestic actors, <laughs> right? Just lack of knowledge and uncertainty. And so some of the themes of the questions are, like, is there anything that you're recommending either that the government should be doing in this uh, to try to foster this, to make it better, to restore trust in how the government does stuff? Similarly, the platforms. Is there stuff that they should be doing? Is there stuff that they could be doing to, to, to reestablish trust? given that you know, it, it, the, the, there's generally a lot of turmoil around this. And so there's a stack of questions in this vein. Well, so you know, one thing that's very obvious is that on all the key subjects, and I think Nathan and I are very privileged to be here uh, talking about these things in front of you, and hopefully you will read the book and uh, you know, uh, stimulate some of these, um, so stimulate thinking around these questions. But on the same subject, I think Reed could have written a very good book, and hopefully will. And so on this question, I'm going to be cheeky. Let's reverse it. I think, <laughs> I think we can learn a lot from Reed too. Maybe you should take this question, uh, <laughs> because you're more informed than we are. Uh, I'm happy to also give my opinion, and I'm sure Nathan will too. Well, this is in part, I mean, we're doing this event around your book, which you've put in, you know, at least, because I've seen discussions and drafts of this for a couple of years on this stuff. So I really want to highlight the things from the book. I mean, I think that there is, I mean, I, it, it, in a broad brush sketch, I tend to think that people tend to go, oh, look, this technology broke this. Oh, what should we do with this technology? And usually you have to say, well, what are the patterns by which we're going to, evolve the technology. It's how do you move the clock forward, not how do you move the clock back. Moving the clock back doesn't work um, and has all kinds of other problems. And then the question comes down to is, and this is why it becomes an inherently political question, which is one of the reasons, despite it being timely, I also think it's relevant to the book, which is, well, if we're going to say we're going to start making judgments about what's true and not true, and we're going to start having that as an editorial filter to some degree across these networks, how do we get to that judgment function? 
who does the judgment function? How do they have the political and moral authority to do it? <laughs> right? And what does that look like? Because you know, part of the, the challenge is they say, well, you know, we're, 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 we're a democracy. We allow people to say what they think because you are allowed to say, you know, I think the moon is made out of blue cheese, <laughs> right? even though it's not. Um, hopefully that's not news to anyone. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and, and that's the problem that I think is the fundamental one that actually underlies this, which is one of the reasons why I raised the question within your renovating democracy, because it isn't just a pure like, okay, let's you know, call up Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, and say, hey, do this, do that. There are some of that stuff, and we try to do that as distance, but some of that is comes to the question of, we go, okay, we're gonna try to slow down the process, we're gonna try to have a deliberative process, we're gonna try to involve citizens, we're gonna try to experts, we're gonna have a, a process that gets to a better outcome versus the hack of an election. But some of this gets down to, well, are we now gonna start proposing ways that we're governing speech, right? And we're gonna do so within the time clocks that work in these social networks. And I think that's what a lot of people actually mean, but then they don't confront two central questions around it. Like, well, who, <laughs> right, and how? Because uh, they go, oh, you know, you know the, 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 so the social network company shouldn't do it. And you're like, okay, they kind of think so too, which is one of the reasons they frustrate everyone because they say, well, we're not touching it at all. We're allowing everyone to say what they do and we're just having it as algorithms, which leads, leads to clickbait and other kinds of problems, which is not good for society and, and democracy, but like, who, and then, and then on the who, the, the how do you get there? Because the who gets, con gets uh, debated. So for example, Facebook has the unenviable position where all of the folks, on the, a lot of the folks on the left and progressive say, well, all your fake news got Trump elected and all the rest of this stuff, and that's a problem. And the folks on the right say, you're trying to censor conservative voices and you're a bunch of, you know, everyone in your company is basically a lefty. So we think you're an institution for the left. And so you get to, they take the fire from both sides and they say, look, we're just trying to do algorithms and allow individuals to express what they want, what they want to do, <laughs> right? And uh, what's more, we'll take these steps to saying, hey, we'll, we'll just allow more of it to be encrypted and it's just individual voices that will authenticate it's actually individual voices and they can do what they want. And that's where they're head, heading. There's a lot of, like, we could spend, you know, a month on this topic. The specific one very relevant to renovating democracy is, well, where does this process of saying we want democracy, we want this kind of accountability of the people, but we want this deliberative process, how does that play into how we should think about maybe what the next steps on social networks should be? And that was the reason I was asking it versus the, my own areas of... No, but know, it's good, expertise. it's good you, uh, to me it's very good that could we heard from you. Uh, you certainly know this subject. Um, and my own feeling uh, is that, you know, the social networks are really sort of part of our lives today. And they are us. I mean, our, our digital selves are not a small thing. They're, they're sort of, we live with them um, as part of us or like a family member. And um, they are, <laughs> they're also a way for us to communicate with the world and with ourselves and with um, and, and sort of sh shape how we think, who we are, how we deal with the world, etc. So incredibly important. Something that's so important should it be in the hands of you know, a commercial enterprise or should it be at the meta level, which is in essence society's level. Personally, I think probably at the end, at, this, at society's level, because it is almost like, you know, a basic good today. Um, meaning, uh, you know, communications like telephone lines became uh, a basic good. In some, you know, even though they were in private hands, uh, highly regulated. And I think social networks today are in a similar position. They're part of uh, everybody's uh, lifeblood in terms of, you know, essential needs uh, every day. And the question is, is it actually fair to ask these se social networks to self-regulate on everything? There's a point where they can't win and they can't do it well. So the question is, what's the balance? Society itself needs to, frankly, take responsibility of it. The question, as Reed said, is how uh, do you put it in the hands of, you know, government and um, in an environment where people distrust government and companies, uh, you know, which is the worst evil 
at the end of the day, depending on how government is run, probably government is the right place, because in theory, government is for everyone. And the question is, is government, uh, can you depoliticize uh, government so it's really there as a service? And that's a little bit what we try to argue in the book, is certain things should be depoliticized. They shouldn't be a winner and a loser. Bring people together, deliberate this question, for example, if you had a citizens' assembly, um, people who were chosen even randomly, bring you know together. How do you best address the question of uh, social networks? How to regulate them? How to you know make it fair uh, as much as possible? You probably get a set of answers or set of proposals that are not unreasonable. Those can then inform um, the elected officials, the appointed bureaucrats and the public. So the idea that it becomes um, uh, you know, a, a way to bring people together as opposed to just a fight. I would just say, uh, it is, we could talk about it for another, <laughs> another four years. <laughs> yes. uh, and, but, you see, but it's a pressing question. You say what happened in New Zealand after the, uh, the massacre at the mosque is you can be put in jail for circulating the video of that guy. Um, I don't have a problem with that, but it fits into the category of what the digital minister in, uh, uh, for Europe said, um, uh, fake news is bad, but um, the ministry of truth is worse. Um, social media is a close cousin of direct democracy. In fact, direct democracy looks, will look a lot like social media without the kind of deliberation we're talking about, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so a lot of the solutions, I know Reed said the other day, in theory, theory and practice, there's no difference between theory and practice. Yes. In theory, <laughs> yes. you want the same kind of deliberative process, uh, as Nicholas mentioned, uh, that you have in direct democracy. Um, one, one, uh, one idea that we talk about in the book is, is uh, safe at any speed, you know, the consumer revolt uh, that created uh, seat buckles, uh, you know, seat belts. Um, we didn't outlaw cars. We just made sure everyone wore seatbelts. Uh, you're not going to outlaw social networks, but you can uh, make them safer. Uh, you can slow down the amplification. It's a, it's a lot of the speed and scope of, ampl uh, of amplification that's a, that's a problem. And then uh, uh, the discourse, uh, Nicholas, uh, the Bagruen Prize was given a couple years ago to Honora O'Neill, the British philosopher who talks about the trust the ethics of communication require trustworthy information. Uh, we're, so trustworthy information if, uh, is an important element of figuring out how do you figure that out. Uh, Piero Major from eBay argues, well, you don't just need a pro and a con, you need to deconstruct people's arguments and see whether arguments support you know, the case they're making, where's the evidence, what's, what's the basis of the evidence, that all needs to be exposed. And what that suggests to uh, to someone like me who's been a, a journalist for my, uh, my whole professional life, is that for the social media companies, instead of hiring third parties, and who knows who these people are who are doing, you know, who are betting this stuff on that, they should uh, have a, a, a funding stream, not, not to third parties, but to the fourth estate, namely, namely real journalists who spend their time verifying facts and reporting, uh, reporting them as such. Um, so let's switch to, because that was the kind of social network question, let's switch to where are the most positive examples we can learn from around the world? Now, we've talked about Singapore and the sovereign wealth funds, also Norway, other places, as places where you essentially get predisposition ownership. Are there any particular examples on the, the positive nationalism that you would think, and is it Canada was the primary one that you would, that you would well, use there? Um, uh, and Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle is a name that we haven't heard in a long time. Yes. Um, Except if you land in uh, Paris. But yes. Yeah, unless you land at the airport. But <laughs> de Gaulle um, was known as a nationalist, right? Who didn't want to be in NATO and uh, wanted European uh, integration, but not too much. Who always argued that. Uh, a little bit like I said, allegiance to inclusive values. He argued that France was a certain idea of France. It wasn't about blood or ethnicity. It was, a role, uh, it was France's destiny in the world. So if nationalism is not based on, uh, like Putin's nationalism, you know, 
your Russian blood. Uh, or I would say Chinese nationalism vis-a-vis -vis its minorities. You're not Han Chinese. Uh, that's a problem. Um, so I think uh, the kind of De Gaulle nationalism um, uh, that was a positive nationalism. Um, yeah, and I think, I think uh, you know... Anything, uh, Condu current, yeah. any, any society today for that? Any? Well, I do, I do think, you know, sure, I, think, I, I do think Canada. I think, okay. I think the idea of the European Union, mm. uh, obviously, for the reason I was talking about, about open, open borders, open mm. sides, fine borders, there's issues in Europe, obviously, with immigration. Mm. But the European project mm. is an example of that. On, on direct democracy, the obvious example is Switzerland. Mm. Switzerland, in fact, California imported the uh, idea of the citizens' initiative from Switzerland. Mm. Um, Switzerland has a very well-developed system through the cantons and at the national level for these referendums. Uh, they already have this idea that I mentioned for California where um, uh, if you, they negotiate with the sponsors and, and if, it, if the sponsors go on the ballot anyway, the legislature can put, uh, the parliament can put on an alternative measure that says this is a better way to reach the same thing. Um, an, an issue in California that, that also uh, is a problem that, they, that, that they've fixed in, in, uh, in, in uh, Switzerland, and it has to do with this depoliticization of the rules and the, and the impartiality of the process. In California, the ballot, what most people see when they go to the ballot is the little um, title and summary that's in, you know, on your, on your, uh, on your ballot. That's written by the Attorney General in California. The Attorney General is an elected official that leans towards uh, the interests that got him or her where they are. And it's, re -elect, and want to be re-elected. Yeah, in Switzerland, in Switzerland, or, the, uh, there's an office, uh, an impartial office, nonpartisan office, some citizens and some officials who write the ballot argument for people to see, to be sure that it's objective. They actually have a sign in their office that says, think like a philosopher, write like a peasant. Hmm. You know? Like a farmer. <laughs> so uh, that's an example of an impartial, impartial, and I come back to this point. Democracy is not only about elections. It's about the impartial rules and institutions and practices that surround that, that make sure everyone's included, and that there can be a belief in the impartiality. And this goes for social media, and it goes for direct democracy. So Switzerland is a good example in that case. And then obviously on, on predistribution, I think Singapore, Singapore is an example uh, of where predistribution works. I mean, I think that indirectly with the Switzerland example, frankly, Singapore is not so dissimilar, but Switzerland is probably the best example, is, you know, government. You know, if you think government is necessary, I certainly think it is. You know, how do you, you know, manage complex societies. Government is really there, or should be there, the service organization to help everyone um, function. It shouldn't be a political instrument. And I think that we are confusing more and more government with sort of, you know, political instruments. And it becomes, um, you know, divisive. And people hate government because they hate something about the government. But if you bring back government as a service organization, service of all citizens, then very different. And Switzerland, I think, has achieved this to a great extent. If you, it's highly depoliticized. I mean, so extreme, uh, you, it would be very hard, I think, in a place like here. But um, Switzerland, if you ask people, who is your president? And there's a president, but there's a rotating president. Um, I would say maybe half the people don't know. Um, so it's very, very extreme. Uh, but services are very good very high quality, um, and very equal. So we only have about a minute left, um, and this is probably too hard of a question for a minute, but I think a quick answer would, uh, would be yes. Yes or no? Perhaps. <laughs> when you're already in the midst of the grip of populism, when you have a political system which is fragmented and combating, and you kind of advocate, well, look, we should actually have discourse, we should think long, and we should come together. What's the path from kind of, call it, information civil war <laughs> to more unity? What would, be the, what would be the light that you would shine? And we only have a minute, so it's, it's a gesture, and it could be, you know, I'm not sure which chapter I'd call, but read chapter seven. <laughs> I, would, I would say the, um, 
some student asked me that the other day uh, after they read the book, you know, the crisis is, is urgent, Do we can wait that long like on climate change. And the, my answer was, um, <clears throat> populism, the current populism that you describe cannot by definition reach the, an the answers necessary because you need a governing consensus to do that. So there's no alternative except to go this path of how do you build a governing consensus or you're not going to be able to address the challenges that, uh, that we've outlined. Um, so uh, I expect the populism to fail and not deliver the goods. And the, and the question now is not just let's get our team back in power. It's, it's like I said in my opening, to mend the institutions of self-government uh, and their link to the, to the public. I think that's, only, that's the only thing that's going to change uh, the situation. I, I, I think, you know, when you're in a, uh, in a period of crisis, and I think we are in a period of crisis, not just here, but really in every democracy around the world, but also in the non-democracies, um, you can see positions hardening. When you're in a crisis, it's a symptom of something. And when you're in a deep crisis, to sort of go back in the past, not really an answer, to um, try to, you know, not deal with it, not an answer, you really need imagination. And I think that this crisis calls for new ideas. And um, that's always the most difficult thing, is to come up with something uh, fresh and new that's going to change. The pre-distribution idea is just an idea, but I do think it's hopefully an act of imagination. We need the same thing on the political side, we need the same thing in terms of having a prosperous and peaceful uh, world where we, for the first time, I think, in the West, will need to coexist with a totally different culture, in this case, China. How do we do this? So we need, I think, imagination and new ideas. So um, sort of we, this is our job, so we, we have to put pressure on ourselves, but it's pressure on all of us as people and as citizens and as humanity to come up with sort of you know, a way to imagine uh, the future, because I think we can, but more than can, we, we will have to. So let's thank Nicholas Bergwin and Nathan Gardels for a great conversation, uh, an awesome book, which I recommend to you, Renovating Democracy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Reid. Thank you, Kamal Swarovski. Um, uh, I'm Reid Hoffman, and this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is now adjourned. <laughs>